Good afternoon, traders and investors. Will back here with another one coming to you with a Wednesday market update. So in today's markets, guys, we got some very nice GDP numbers earlier on in the morning. However, they were not enough to carry the markets into green territory throughout the day. Most of the damage to the markets was done in the overnight session, more specifically during the London session. You can see this candle right here, the 4 a.m. candle, which is pretty much the first hour of the London session, took the SPY down about 0.4% and took QQQ down about 0.56%. And the market's really not able to recover intraday despite that positive report coming out in the US market open. So, tomorrow as well, we have another big piece of data in the PCE inflation report, otherwise known as the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation report. So, we will see in tomorrow's report is inflation still hot using the PCE metrics? as it was as previously shown earlier on in the month when using CPI and also the PPI from the producer standpoint. So one last little inflation report on January is coming tomorrow. It'll be curious to see how the markets react to that. Now, in today's video, we're gonna be covering those GDP numbers, of course. We're gonna cover two earnings from uh, two companies that I like very much. Number one is going to be Snowflake. The other one is going to be Salesforce. They came out with earnings after the close on the day today. Tomorrow morning, guys, we have a big one in Celsius holding, so we'll be covering that one after the close tomorrow. And we will also be doing Autodesk, a very interesting company for the next six to 12 months. So those are a couple of the earnings previews that we'll do tomorrow, today, Snowflake and Salesforce. And then after that, we're obviously gonna do our major market rundowns in terms of technical analysis on major indexes, our major tech names as well to conclude. So without further ado, guys, let's get right into today's video. SPY ending the day down 0.13%, QQQ down 0.53%, and the Russell kind of taking a little bit of a beating as well, down about 0.82%, the loss leader on the day. Take a look at your heat map here. You will see that big tech once again in the red, led down yet again, unfortunately, by Google. Google still being plagued with those negative AI news headlines. On the rest of the market, however, we did have some decent performance on the day by financials, but healthcare rotating to the downside and the bottom half of the market wasn't all that much better. You did have some little bit of outperformance here in consumer cyclicals and industrials, but for the most part, fairly mixed market on the day. Take a look at your one day relative performance. You can see that even better, very mixed market guys with communication services leading it to the downside, notably communication services mostly Google and Meta to the downside, your major loss contributors for that. So what happened with the GDP report, guys? Well, it was a very good GDP report. The US economy grew a solid 3.2% in the fourth quarter, a slight downgrade from government's initial estimate. The initial estimate, guys, was 3.3%. So a little bit of a revision to the downside, but still extremely solid. So the US economy grew at a robust 3.2% annual pace from October through December. Quick reminder, anything above two is outstanding. The expansion in the nation's GDP, the economy's total output of goods and services, slipped from a red hot 4.9% from July through September. That was way too high, by the way. The fourth quarter GDP numbers were revised down from the 3.3 all the way down to about 3.2. Now, US growth has topped 2% for six straight quarters, defying fears that high interest rates would tip the world's largest economy into a recession, right? Hasn't happened so far. Far from stumbling, the economy grew 2.5% for all of 2023, topping the 1.9% growth in 2022. So the economy, guys, is extremely healthy still, but could that be a catalyst to lead Jerome Powell to delay interest rates? Yes, but he can't delay the inevitable, guys. As we've been saying, we are on a designated timeline at this point. Rates are coming down this year, whether the market likes it or not, more specifically in May or June. Wednesday's report also showed inflation pressures continuing to ease. So we got the quarterly PCE data. The Federal Reserve's favorite measure of prices, the PCE index, rose at 1.8% annual rate in the fourth quarter. That's extremely good, guys. Down from 2.6% in the third, stripping out volatile food and energy prices, so-called core inflation for PCE, was up only 2.1%, accelerating slightly from a 2% increase in the third quarter. So here is your GDP numbers. That's a very good quarterly read on PCE inflation data, by the way. We'll see what comes out tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be the January month PCE report. But as of last quarter, PCE trending nicely to the downside. And you can see this GDP chart clearly shows that the economy is still very, very healthy, guys. Whenever you get over 2% growth on a quarter over quarter basis and then translated into annual growth over 2% as well, it just shows the economy is very resilient, very healthy too. 
The United States is expected to keep churning out growth in 2024. Here's your guidance. The International Monetary Fund expects the American economy to expand 2.1% this year. So definitely not recession guidance, is it? More than twice its forecasts for growth in the major advanced economies such as Japan, Germany, the UK, France, and Italy. So outpacing pretty much everyone. All in all, guys, very, very solid report. Economy is strong. Jobs market apparently still is strong as well. Inflation is coming down. So everything is moving in the right direction. So let's just keep um, let's just keep on with this bullish narrative that we have for stocks because I do believe it will continue. The data is pointing bullish as well. So we will always go in the direction of the data. Everything is getting better and better. It's just these markets, guys, the economy moves slow, right? So to get any meaningful change, we need a lot and lot a lot of data it'll be very curious to see what Jerome Powell has to say about the whole situation come the March 20th meeting so that's pretty much for your uh, it for your GDP news let's dive into some earnings right away we're going to start it off with snowflake so snowflake in the after hours guys down pretty much 20 25 percent take a look at this big drop from the close all the way down as low as 25 percent now settling for about a 20 percent loss on earnings so what exactly happened well the company did have a double beat they beat nicely on eps snowflake has usually beaten every single quarter for the past two years in terms of eps so it could be stated that they always give a bit light guidance in order to beat it thereafter but nonetheless they did beat on eps substantial beat and a nice little beat on revenue where did the decline come from guys well, the CEO stepped down, unfortunately, and they missed guidance for 2025. They guided for a revenue growth rate to be a bit slower than usual. Snowflake, Snowflake usually always wants to grow at about 30% revenue on year over year, especially for the valuation to make sense, but they guided for only 22%. So here's a few headlines on Snowflake. If you don't know what the company does, this company is a cloud data storage and data interpretation business. So essentially, when companies have a bunch of data, they compile obviously tremendous amounts of data from their customers, and they need some place to not only store that data, but also to interpret if there's any common trends happening uh, within that data, which could obviously help them improve their products for these customers so it's all about data analytics for this company and they are known to be one of the leaders in the industry for uh, data interpretation services but also they do a bunch of storage for uh, large companies as well now they're one of the favorite platforms for developer arguably the favorite platform for developers so a lot of companies, guys, like Microsoft, Google, Microsoft, Azure, Google Cloud, and Amazon Web Services, you obviously know as them as being cloud data storage services. So they also have units of their those divisions that process the data. But when you're a company and you have dev and you have developers that are searching for uh, to interpret the data that your company puts out your all your company data is going to be stored on the cloud either through Microsoft Amazon or through Google but then your developer team has to develop models and ways of interpreting that data now there's a few tools that they can use at their disposal to analyze that data snowflake is one of them but Amazon Microsoft and Google have their own in-house softwares that can also analyze the data however when you go on forums and message boards and even on YouTube videos, the preferred tool to analyze the data is indeed Snowflake. They compare it pretty much to Apple versus Android. The ease of use that Apple has and within the ecosystem as well that makes it extremely easy to interpret and easy to work with is the same thing that Snowflake provides for data interpretation. They're very easy to work with and very easy for developers to learn quickly and be able to model and analyze the data that the company is storing. Now, 85% of the cloud data applications that Snowflakes, Snowflakes runs is ran on AWS. So that is a very big thing. It's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a, a symbiotic relationship between Snowflake and Amazon. They do have two competing products in the marketplace right now, but because of that, because of the fact that they're competing in the same sales vertical, um, it's good competition in the aspect that 
everybody wins in this terms of competition. So when Amazon is competing with Snowflake, uh, both of their businesses tend to grow streamlined, which is why Amazon doesn't have a problem referring a lot of its own customers over to Snowflake and vice versa. When, when people ask Snowflake for data warehousing services, they are pushing Amazon quite heavily as well. So it's a bit of a symbiotic relationship between the two, which is why Amazon shares prices were also down in the after hours in a response to the Snowflake prices going down. So that relationship here is a key, key, key relationship too. Uh, their three top clients for Snowflake are Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. Now the CEO is stepping down. We'll take a look at that. They have high revenue, high EPS growth for the foreseeable future. This is true. So if you take a look here at their growth on EPS, very good EPS growth for the next couple of years and very, very decent revenue expansion for the foreseeable future as well, despite having a little bit of a slowdown in 2024. This is nothing new, guys. A lot of a lot of cloud uh, cloud data management companies and also cybersecurity companies and a lot of other software as a service companies this most recent quarter have guided that 2024 is still going to be a little bit of a transition year as their clients, mainly big businesses, are cutting down on software spending. So that is what's slowing Snowflake a little bit down. Just it's other companies that are cutting costs. And when they cut costs, they look to cut down on either subscription services for software or just uh, basic outlays of software um, basically for their company, right? So that is what is slowing them down a little bit. They have a low amount of debt. This is true. So nothing bad to say in that respect. The balance sheet of the company is extremely healthy coming into the quarter here with only about $280 million worth of debt and cash to cash equivalents of or over pretty much a billion dollars at this point. So that is very good. The growth is slowing in 2024. It's temporary. The entire industry is going through this. We've seen this in time and time again uh, through companies reporting over this past quarter. Now, the valuation of the company, guys, the valuation has always been a concern. Now, this company was supposed to IPO at $60. They ended up IPOing all the way at $240 because of just the massive interest that the company had. But the valuation has always been a concern, despite having EPS growth of 35% for the next couple of years. And uh, despite having very high revenue growth as well, usually between 28 to 35%. Well, their 2024 PE ratio, if we were to take their earnings at the end of 2024, so at the end of this year coming up, uh, it, their PE ratio is about 162. Now, considering the fact that they grow really fast, Still, it puts their peg at 4.62 and we're using the after earnings drop price of $184. So even at 184, it is very rich, guys. Anything but a, a peg ratio, anything below one is outstanding. Between one and two is okay. Over two becomes a problem. When you're in the four or five range, guys, it's just extremely high. For this company to be fairly priced in terms of all valuation metrics, the share price would literally need to be cut in half from here. But it's always traded at a rich valuation ever since IPO. And it is one of those stocks that's a Wall Street darling. Wall Street just loves this stock for some reason, despite its high valuation. So that's what's uh, that's what's uh, enabled it to kind of maintain these high valuations. That being said, the 180 zone does represent a decent little area of pull back here. We're just looking for this whole previous resistance area to act as newfound support. We'll see what happens, but they definitely did have the monthly breakout. We'll now be retesting this range. Hopefully the company can recover in the near term future. Now let's take a look at some of your news headlines on the company here. So, and then we'll go over the earnings extremely quickly. Snowflake uh, revenue guidance for Snowflake for fiscal 2025 came in well below expectations. Snowflake stock plunged as the company announced its chief executive, Frank Slootman, will retire. And Frank was a veteran in the game, guys. He was one of the uh, leading drivers be behind ServiceNow and their uh, initial public offering back in the day. So take a look at ServiceNow ever since Frank pretty much took over back in uh, the mid 20 2010s, 2013s-ish part. Look how much growth he gave that company. He really did a great job. And then he joined Snowflake when they went public just about three years ago at this point. So he's really a veteran in the game. So it's kind of sad to see his departure. Now, Snowflake said a former top executive at Google's advertising business, Sridhar Ramaswamy, will be its new CEO. Now, Ramaswamy had been senior VP of artificial intelligence at Snowflake, so he's definitely not new to the company. Uh, Frank Slootman will continue to serve as chairman of the board at Snowflake, so at least he'll have somewhat of a, you know, um, somewhat of participation in what the company is doing going forward, and he can still be there to provide some decent guidance for the company. Now, Snowflake stock, 2025, 
guidance is light. So the reason for the drop, guys, 25% drop, it does make sense. For fiscal 2025, Snowflake forecast product revenue growth of roughly 22% to 3.25 billion versus the consensus estimate for 30% growth to 3.4 billion. So this company is now slowing growth in 2024. That's a big slowdown, guys. When you take the slowdown of the the slowdown of this growth rate, right? 22 divided by 30. It's roughly a 27% slowdown for the year, and the stock is down roughly 25%. So these guidances, guys, they matter, right? We've seen this a lot of times in the past uh, few weeks, whereby when companies miss guidance for by 15, 20, 25% for the foreseeable future, that's literally how much their stock drops in the after hours. So a bit unfortunate for them. Now let's take a look at some of their highlights here from their shareholder slides. You can see that they did have a very good prior year uh, on the quarter, 30, 30% uh, year over year growth on on the fourth quarter, $738 million. Total revenue for the year, $2.6 billion. So very, very good 38% year-over-year growth. But as we just saw, growth will be slowing next year to only 22%. Net revenue retention rate, 131%. This is very, very good, guys. This just means that every customer is, is being retained by the business. But not only that, each and every con con uh, consumer is spending more on the business. So getting even more products and service from Snowflake once they're in their ecosystem. Total customers, very good, 22% year over year growth. And the number of customers that are over $1 million per year customers is up 39% year over year growth up to about 461 um, customers that pay over a million dollars for these services in 12 months. Very, very good. Out of those customers, all these customers, you have 2,000 of the Forbes Global 2000 customers. You have 691 of them. So pretty much one third of that entire index is uh, our member partners of Snowflake 2. Now, this is just reiterated when, reiterated when we take a look at their early part of their slide deck. You can see the amount of different companies that use this service. So Amazon Web Services is up here, but a lot of very well-known companies, right? Companies like Deloitte trust them as well. Uh, very, very big. Infosys, a lot of uh, other accounting firms, KPMG, Microsoft is down here, of course. Salesforce, another one. S&P Global, which we talk about on the channel. Trade Desk, and the list just goes on, guys, right? Rakuten, uh, Ice Exchange, PepsiCo. So their list of clients is quite endless and are the biggest uh, and best companies in the game right now. Now let's take a look at some of their uh, highlights for the year end. So we're going to take a look at the strong combination of scale and growth. So here you have your scaling of growth. But as I said, guys, growth is slowing down into 2024. And that's what investors are concerned about. Is it only going to be 2024? Or will this growth slow down last into 25, 26, 27? Now management on the call said it was only as of 2024. And it has nothing to do with the company specific. It's more part of a broader industry slowdown for cloud management services as other big firms are just cutting down on costs this year, trying to maintain those good net margins with these high interest rates. So it all makes sense. Quarterly, quarterly revenue has been netly up as well. That's very, very good. Significant customer commitment. So here you see your remaining performance obligations. This is just a fancy word of saying how many sales do they have in the pipeline moving forward? So at the end of the quarter, they have about $5.1 billion in uh, current performance obligations remaining. So in deliverables that they have to deliver to their clients uh, that are paying for these services. So that is about a year and a half's worth of revenue uh, at the current run rate. So very, very good pipeline for the business still. Lead landing strategic organization. So this is another way of them showing you that they are acquiring customers on a quarter over quarter basis and on a yearly on a year over year basis as well. Now, the retention rate is also fairly good, but you can see that it has dropped down in the past one year. Now, this drop in the retention rate, although the number absolute on an absolute basis is still extremely high at 131 percent, it is down from the all time highs of the business at about the mid 170 range. This is also a attributed uh, by management to just the slowdown from the broader industry in terms of businesses spending less on software. Now, improving product gross margin, this is also good. Keep in mind that a company like Snowflake has never been profitable to the bottom line. If I didn't mention this, my apologies before, but they are still not profitable, still have never had a positive quarter of net income. So that is something definitely working against them. But as we'll see lower in the investor slides down here, they are listening to shareholders and are starting to manage their costs a little bit better. So their non-GAAP product gross margin is going up. So their costs have 
of goods sold is going down. That's very, very good. So they're increasing revenue and cost of goods sold is either it's just increasing slightly less. So that's why you have an improvement in product gross margin. But with such high gross margins, guys, they need to start bringing some of that money at least to the bottom line. Now, operating leverage while investing in growth. So we bring up this term a long time. Operating leverage just means are they growing revenue faster than they're growing expenses? And here you can see that they are indeed doing that. So we don't have to break it down ourselves in the financial statement. So thank you to Snowflake for doing that for us. So non-GAAP operating expenses as a percentage of revenue. You can see that all of these are coming down. So your, your uh, clear blue area down here from fiscal year 22, 23, 24, that is your sales and marketing spend. As a percentage of total revenue, you can see it went from 43% two years ago down to 37%. So their costs are coming down. They're just increasing less quickly than revenue is increases that increasing. That's what you want to see. Your research and development is up in 2024. That's okay. Research and development is one of the only things that I will not mind seeing a company increase, especially a company of this nature uh, where they have to be at the forefront of technology and data management. So that's okay. I'll give it to them. But where we really need to see management is sales and marketing and general and administrative spend and G DNA spend in teal up here is also down a few percentage points, almost pretty much cut in half, guys, uh, over the past two years. So it's nice to see in the two categories that really matter for this company, expenses are coming down as a percentage of total revenue. So that is very, very good, guys. Now, their non-GAAP adjusted free cash flow as a percentage of revenue is also increasing. So eventually, the hope is for them to be both non-GAAP and GAAP profitable. So we're going to be looking forward to that, guys. Still, though, however, not going to be profitable, at least for the next two years is the guidance. Now, here we have a little bit of focus on free cash flow generation. And you can see that as a whole, right, as a whole, the company has been doing a good job of trying to generate positive free cash flow on a non-GAAP basis. So this is just non-generally accepted accounting principles. So we want to see this happen on a GAAP basis. So this is why they have positive earnings per share. You can see this right here. And we go to their positive, uh, their positive earnings per share. So you can see it's positive, but if you were to put it on generally accepted accounting principles, unfortunately, it's not positive. So Snowflake doing a little bit of accounting magic to show you that they're trying to generate positive free cash flow, but it's just not there yet. Now we have a little bit of hiring here by the company, not expanding too, too, too much, but would like to see them kind of diminish the rate that they're hiring, especially uh, in this uh, environment where they have a slowdown in revenues too. So that's pretty much everything from their slides that I wanted to show you. One of the last one was the guidance, right? So here is your guidance. Here's the reason for the drop in the after hours, pretty much product revenue guidance, $3.2 billion, that's only 22%. You can see how much this year-over-year -year revenue growth has come down since the company has went public. You need to see this number over 30% for the valuation to make sense at these prices. That's why when we had this big little hit on guidance, the shareholders really did not like it in the after hours. Non-GAAP product gross margin, so your gross margin rates are still relatively high. That is good. Your non-GAAP operating margin is positive, but as we said, guys, it doesn't matter. They need to be positive on the bottom line across all accounting standards uh, as a whole. So that's pretty much everything that we had for Snowflake there. Let us take a very brief look at some of their uh, deeper financials here. So if we take a look, guys, I didn't have their financial statements, unfortunately, so couldn't take a look uh, at that too much. We didn't have their balance sheet to show you guys a rundown of their debt. But what I did want to show you here, guys, is a bit down below here in terms of we're not going to go over the, the revenue and the cost breakdown because we already did that in terms of percentages. The one thing that I wanted to show you guys is right here, okay? The stock-based compensation charges. You guys know that I love this a lot. And here you see... As a fiscal year 2024, this egregious amount right here, $1.2 billion. Keep in mind, guys, they made $2.8 billion in revenue. Take a look at how much this impacts their bottom line, right? So 1.2 divided by your, excuse me, divided by your 2.8, that's literally 43% of all revenue goes to stock-based compensation. This has been a major problem for the company that not only myself, but retail and institutional investors have been complaining about 
from Snowflake for the past couple of years. It's just the same in prior year, guys. It's just as bad. Look, from fiscal year 2022, we more than doubled revenue, but we also almost doubled stock-based compensation. It is absolutely ridiculous. 2022, the amount of stock-based compensation as an expression of revenue, 59%. 2023, 888 divided by 2065, 43%, and this year, roughly the same, right? 40, 43%. It's just too much, guys. Look what happens to your shares. You just get diluted. Look, this is your Snowflake shares outstanding in the past three years. And as you can see, from the moment they IPO'd, they're literally up a ridiculous amount, right? On a year over year basis, they've pretty much like 2X, almost 3X their amount of shares outstanding from the moment of time they went public just because of all that share dilution. So not only is the valuation already extremely expensive as it is at a peg ratio of 4.62, but on top of that, they keep diluting you. So the valuation just gets even worse. Now, they have started a plan with $2 billion in share buybacks for the next coming year, but it's gonna take a while for those buybacks to outweigh the damage that has already been done, right? So that's the unfortunate part, too much share dilution. However, it's nice to see that they are addressing the dilution. They have $2 billion of share buybacks coming in the next coming year. So finally, at least the bleeding is stopped. But Snowflake as a whole, guys, valuation too rich, a little bit too rich for me for this company. Not my favorite play. I understand why people love the company, but the valuation for me just has me sticking away. So that's pretty much everything for Snowflake. Now let's cover Salesforce. So Salesforce is a very, very beautiful company, guys doesn't have a lot of the problems we just talked about in Snowflake. So Salesforce also came out with earnings after the close. And if you look in the after hours, guys, they had a very mixed reaction to their earnings, initially tumbling pretty much five, six percent, and now back to pretty much break even after their earnings. So what exactly happened? Well, we had a beat on earnings by about one percent. We had a beat on revenue by about one percent as well. So all in all, it was a little bit of a beat, but their guidance was a little bit disappointing. Now, if you don't know what Salesforce does, they're the industry leader in CRM, not just because their ticker is CRM. CRM stands for Client relationship models. So essentially what they do, guys, is let's say you are a bank and you have, let's say, 10, 20, 30,000 customers that are always calling you for different issues. Well, what Salesforce does is they will build you what they call a client relationship management software. That's just a fancy way of saying it's a, it's a program that lets you keep track of all your customer interactions. So when somebody calls you, let's say I call the bank, right? When William calls the bank, well, they'll note down in my file, okay, he's called this date, this date, this date for X, Y, Z reason. It just allows these institutions to be to have a better time of following up on their client requests and have a history of uh, what their client interactions have been in the past. So that's what they do for companies. Very, very well-known software in the business world. It's actually the software that I used to use when I used to work at the bank as well. So I know their product very well. It's a very, very good product, guys. Now, They've been cost management centered since 2023. This company has had a little bit of problems, guys, generating money to the bottom line. They have very, very high gross margins. So revenue minus cost of goods sold, a bit like Snowflake, about 75%, but they're just unable to bring those gross margins down to net margins because of how many operating expenses they have. So that is the problem with this company, not able to drive enough money to the bottom line. Now, they did have a record year of free cash flow, so their free cash flow has never been a problem. They also have a decent amount of uh, cash and cash equivalents versus their debt. We'll take a look at that when we take a look at the numbers, but just at a quick glance here, they have about $13, $14 billion worth of debt and cash and cash equivalents as of the most recent update is actually up to about $14 billion as well, so no problem there. They brought in about $9.8 billion worth of free cash flow this year, record year of free cash flow for them, so debt is not a problem for them. Free cash flow is very good. Revenue growth of 10% through 2027, EPS growth of 2020, uh, 25% through 2027 as well. So the forecast is extremely beautiful for Salesforce. Take a look at this very beautiful EPS expansion over the next three, four years, as they've really gotten their costs under control over the past couple of years, over the past year at least, and revenue expansion is neat as well. So their price to earnings at a price of roughly $300 right now for 2024 is about a 31.2, not that bad, and it gives them a peg when we take this PE ratio as an expression of their growth for the next three years, only about a 1.25. So even if the stock price is trading roughly at all-time highs, the peg ratio is really not that bad for this company's guys. I wouldn't say it's the bargain of the century, but it's definitely not overvalued. I'd say it's right in line with expectations 
And you can see analysts here, their price target is all the way between 300 all the way up to 390 390 is possibly a little bit high for the company. I would put it somewhere in the 340 to $350 range over the next 12 months myself. So the stock does have some room to grow. Now let's take a look at some of their numbers here, guys. So taking a look at your uh, Salesforce data. So Salesforce data, if it can load for me, excuse me, about, so apologize about that. Let's take a quick sip of coffee. Ever since I've been loading this uh, PDF reader pretty much into my browser to be able to highlight things in real time, it slowed a couple of things down. I'm not too sure why. Maybe I just need to get uh, another one potentially. But let's take a look at the headlines here. Salesforce sees annual revenue below estimates on weak cloud demand. So same thing as Snowflake 2024 transition year for a lot of businesses cutting down on software expenses. Salesforce expanded its stock buyback program, program by $10 billion and announced a new dividend, but its annual revenue forecast that was below estimates pushed its shares down around 2% in after hours trading. The company's downbeat forecast signals a likely slowdown in cloud and tech spending as clients grapple with high interest rates and rising inflation, compelling them to keep a lid on costs, exactly what we said for Snowflake. The company sees revenue between 37.7 to 38 billion for 2025, compared with the analyst expectations of 38.62. So a little bit of a miss here, guys, right? Talking about maybe just about 2% miss for 2025 revenue guidance, but still a little bit of a miss. Warnings of a slow economy prompted Salesforce to cut about 700 employees, or roughly 1% of its workforce last month, adding to the slew of layoffs off the, um, across the tech and media industry. Salesforce is guiding for only 8 to 9% growth for the full year, which moves it out of the high growth category. In order to make up for that, it is introducing a dividend, which is appropriate for the lower level of growth. This is true. Salesforce finally implementing a little bit of a dividend payable uh, to shareholders in the future, about 40 cents on a quarterly basis. So not that high. In early 2023, Salesforce had become target for activist investors to push changes resulting in cost cuts, increased share buybacks, and a dismantled mergers and acquisitions committee. So finally cutting down on costs as we were saying they have a net margin problem so when they have a net margin problem shareholders always ask the same thing do share buybacks with your free cash flow and start cutting expenses to drive shareholder returns salesforce expects adjusted profit between 968 to 976 for the full year compared with estimates of 957 so little bit of a decline in total revenue guidance but because the fact that they're increasing prices within the company, they do expect the profit margins to be a little bit better. So a little bit, you know, you have one negative side declining revenues ever so slightly 2%, right? Uh, for the year in terms of growth. Um, against the expectation, company still growing, but just 2% less than the expectation, right? But they do have a nice little bump in profit here uh, by roughly the same measure by about, you know, 1% to 2% as well. So kind of, you know, counterbalancing news right there. Now let's take a look at some of their, in, uh, their investor slides to get a better gist into what the company or how the company is operating. So Salesforce is the number one CRM provider uh, worldwide by revenue for 10 consecutive years, consistently delivering durable revenue growth, more than tripling from 10.5 billion in 2020. 2018 to 35 billion in 2024. Very good growth for them, guys, right? Fastest growing top five enterprise software company with $35 billion in revenue fiscal year 2024. So pretty much patting themselves on the back. Now let's take a look at their financials to see is that back padding warranted? Well, indeed, it actually is here, guys. So on a gap basis, you do have total revenues up year over year, 11% to the upside. Very good. Current remaining performance obligation. So how many sales do they have currently in the pipeline? About 12% to the upside from last year. They still have about $27.6 billion, almost a year's full year's worth of uh, revenue in the pipeline. Uh, for the current year, and then total remaining performance obligation, just about under two years worth of revenue in the pipeline. So that is very good. Still have a lot of sales in the pipeline for the company. Operating margins at about 14.4%, not high enough in my uh, in my opinion, but still good. And they did have operating cash flow of about 10.2 billion, not so much CapEx. So their free cash flow is about 9.5, 9.8 billion. We'll get to that down below. Now, Let's take a look at some of their other headlines here and we'll see why this guidance is very important. So total revenue guidance, here's your full year guidance. So there you go, there's your year over year growth of about 9%. Analysts were expecting 10, 11%. So this little under 10% growth, unfortunately hitting the company where it hurts. Now gap operating margin, guide for about 20.4%. That's very good. 
in terms of their operating margin uh, as well, and their operating cash flow growth, which is what you want to see for the company, about 21 to 24%. So the company is growing fairly well, guys. I'm not gonna say outstanding. I mean, the for operating free cash flow growth, that is very good. The revenue growth, not so much, but at least they'll be trying to bring more and more of that revenue to the bottom line. That's gonna be the goal for Salesforce in 2024. Now let's take a look at their operating leverage. So Q4 fiscal year 2024, non-gap expense profile. So this is where you wanna see does the company have operating leverage? A bit like Snowflake. Are they able to grow revenue faster than their expenses? And the answer here is once again, yes. So you can see a net little improvement from Q4 of 2023 to Q4 of 2024, 3% improvement in expenses versus, versus revenue growth. And you can see that their marketing and sales percentage of revenue is down from 34 to 32%. That's good. Their cost of goods sold as well, this gray box right here, is down from 21 to about 19. The research and development, as I've been saying, I will allow that for a company to spend more money. That's perfectly normal. It is a software company, so they need to. And then 6%, pretty much flat in terms of general and administrative percentage. So this is very good, guys. Expenses are being streamlined across the business. They're being controlled, which is exactly what shareholders want. And in return, they're generating more free cash flow. And what are they doing with that free cash flow? giving it back to you, the shareholder, which is very, very, very good if you ask me. Now they repurchased $7.7 .7 billion of shares in uh, fiscal year 2024. They fully offset dilution this year from fiscal year 2024 stock-based compensation. So here you can see good repurchases leading to flat year over year share count growth. This was a problem. This is Salesforce shares outstanding from 2010 to 2023. You can see why shareholder dilution is a problem, guys. If they compensate management and executives too much, look what happens to your shares outstanding. They literally double in 13 years. Now, finally, the company is addressing the issue, starting to do heavy buybacks, and now the share count has peaked and starting to decrease a little bit. But you see why increased shareholder compensation, uh, shareholder compensation is a big problem for companies. So nice to see them address that, and they still have about $10 billion uh, in the pipeline for uh, share buybacks, $10 billion in terms of the mark, uh, the company's market cap is not that much. It's only about 3.5%, but still, it is a very welcome thing when you're used to the company, right? Diluting, it's very welcome to see them now being able to still being able to buy down about 3.5% of shares outstanding. So very, very good presentation from CRM as a whole. A few of their financial numbers that I did want to mention, guys. I mean, take a look why this company has a problem with expenses, right? Take a look at their gross profit. Gross profit, is basically an expression. You just remove the cost of goods sold from your total revenues. So you can see, after you remove cost of goods sold, they have a 75% gross profit margin, which is very good, guys. Where it all falls apart is down here in your unfortunate operating expenses. Now, research and development. You can see at least, as we saw in the previous slides here, they've maintained it flat, right? So I'll give them that. They have to do R&D, no problem. But marketing and sales? $13 billion, I mean, I understand it's down from 2023, but still, $13 billion, that's only half of your gross profit, guys. It's just too much, in my opinion. I mean, who doesn't know about Salesforce? And in terms of companies, right, they're the leader. They don't need to do that much marketing and sales, in my humble opinion. So this number needs to come down, and if they can cut this number in half, they will have a lot more profit at the bottom line. General administrative expenses, not so high, guys. They've maintained that roughly flat on a year-over-year -year basis as well. Now, here's a restructuring charge. So you have a restructuring charge. What is that? Very interesting, guys. Let's take a look below. In January 2023, the company announced a restructuring plan intended to reduce operating costs, improve operating margins, and continue advancing the company's ongoing commitment to profitable growth. So they realized costs are a problem. Now they're addressing it. The restructuring plan includes a reduction of the company's workforce and select real estate exits and office space reductions within certain markets. So this restructuring car charge is basically paying uh, employee compensation when they fire them and also slimming down on office space. So nice to see them restructuring the business for the better. Now let's take a look at a few more metrics, guys, and then we're pretty much uh, done with this one as it was fairly solid. So here's your balance sheet. We just want to see, does the company 
have more cash than it has debt? Well, you can see yes, in terms of cash and cash equivalents and investments, they have about $14 billion worth of uh, cash available to them. And in terms of their long-term debt, well, it's only about 8.4. If you were to add their lease liabilities and other non-currents, their total is only about $13.5 billion in long-term debt obligations or long-term liabilities, which is largely offset by their cash pile. So very, very good cash management for them. Stock-based compensation expense, not that bad, guys. $2.7 billion, which is roughly about 10% uh, of revenue at this point. So not that bad, but it is offset by the heavy buybacks that they did over the course of the year. So look, they diluted you by about 2.7 billion, but they did buy back 7.6 billion. So you know, we do have a net burn rate of shares here, which is what you want to see uh, for any given company specifically. Now, if we take one last look down here, guys, I just want to show you their free cash flow. They had a record year in free cash flow, $9.5 billion. That's up from $6.3 billion in 2024. And I expect this number to improve if they just continue focusing on their cost control. So as a whole, guys, CRM, very decent company, nothing bad to say, no red flags. They're doing everything necessary to advance the business in the right direction. Cost control, share buybacks, continuously expanding revenue and everything like that. And the valuation is also not that bad, guys. Not really a buy for me, guys. If it were to become a buy for me, I would really need to see this one again in the 250, 260 range. It gets the valuation down a little bit more and the peg ratio becomes closer to about a 1.1, which is really an area that I would like to see a lot. If I can get this one again for 250, 260, that is where I like playing short puts on the company myself. So with all that being said, guys, that's it for your earnings. Now let's take a quick look into our indexes and major tech names, shall we? Let's get into it. So in terms of the SPY, SPY down 0.13%, right? So we were looking for the continuation of the daily uptrend, just looking for a daily higher low for further trend continuation. PCE numbers tomorrow are going to be absolutely crucial. If they're too hot and we take back too much of this move, guys, could set up for the daily lower high, daily lower low. And at that point, guys, if we lose the 12 EMA and we lose the daily uptrend and lose the trend at the same time, you know that we'll be heading into weekly consolidation. But as of now, everything good, guys. Just keep a very, very close eye tomorrow. If we do pull back, how much of this move do we pull back? If we give it all back, it's not looking the best for the medium term. At that point, we could see some weekly consolidation, but obviously bulls with tons of space to run. Very curious to see how that data comes out tomorrow. As of now, it is still a daily bull flag. Just looking for a daily higher low. Anything above 493 area, daily higher low for further trend continuation. So no red flags as of yet. Tomorrow's inflation data is key. And QQQ, same thing pretty much, right? Daily bull flag, just looking for that daily higher low for further trend continuation, reacting nicely from our 12 EMA right here. Anything above 421.29, just looking daily higher low for daily trend continuation here. If we pull back too much from that inflation report, we open the door for daily lower high, lower low, loss of the trend line as well. And then QQQ as well will be consolidating on the weekly, but anything above 396, just going to be looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation. So tomorrow's inflation report could send us into a bit of weekly consolidation if it is bad. Keep in mind the month of February is now over. We'll be going over the monthly candle closes pretty much tomorrow uh, on the 1st of March with the PCE data too. But all in all, QQQ not looking too bad. Tomorrow's data is key as well. Now moving on to financials. Financials also looking very, very healthy here, guys, right? So daily uptrend right now, daily higher low is set at yesterday's low. 39.91. Keep an eye on that tomorrow if the inflation report is bad and we flush this. It would be daily downtrend for financials bulls. Financials have not had a confirmed daily downtrend, guys, since pretty much your October sell off. So if we get a daily downtrend all the way at the top up here, it would most likely lead into weekly consolidation. Anything above $37 on the weekly is just for a very healthy weekly pullback. And if the report is good, well, financials may just continue in this daily uptrend. 12 EMA is going to be your guide. We haven't lost this, so it will be crucial to protect this tomorrow if we lose it. But if it's good, if the date is good, we keep marching higher, guys. You guys know where we're going. All-time high area of resistance, 40.8, and then all the way up to roughly 41.5. Almost there on financials. Now moving on to healthcare. Healthcare not looking that bad as well. Still retracing ever so slightly. So healthcare is in a very gorgeous little uptrend right now. Rejecting nicely from your 12 EMA. But now the bears are starting to come down a little bit hot in your previous higher low at 144.29. Keep an eye on that level, guys. If the report is bad tomorrow and we lose this level, they'll lose the daily uptrend, open the door for potential daily downtrend.
uptrend. At that point, it will be weekly consolidation underway. And weekly consolidation, pretty much, look for these levels, the previous all-time highs, guys. That is this uh, pink line right here. The 142 should line up nicely with our 12 EMA if we do consolidate into that region as well. So tomorrow's report is very crucial for the markets. But as of now, bulls still protecting the daily uptrend. If the report is good, daily uptrend, just continuing at this point, past, uh, you know, passed on to new all-time highs. All in all, no red flags for healthcare. Most of all the red flags would open up tomorrow if the report is bad. So crucial day tomorrow for the markets, guys. Now let's move into IWM Russell. IWM Russell performing fairly decently on the day, right? 0.82 to the downside, but at least we haven't rejected completely, you know, 1.52% to the downside today. Tomorrow, another key day as well. Once again, unable to close up here, guys. Look at this weekly candle. If Thursday and Friday retrace this, once again, we will not be able to close above the 201 area, above this whole area of resistance, right? So that's going to be crucial for us as of now. The bulls are still in control of this daily uptrend, despite this relatively close triple top that we have here. The line in the sand level for me is 196.42. If you lose 196.42 in the forthcoming days, it's daily downtrend. And at that point, it'll just be further weekly consolidation as we continue to tighten up this weekly zone of accumulation right here. You know, it's going to be tough for us to break and close above this area, guys, in my opinion, without very good data from inflation, because this chart is so dependent on interest rate cuts, right? So we need some good data from inflation and we need some Federal Reserve positivity on rate cuts coming later this year. Only after that will the Russell fly. As of now, the bulls still are in control, but I need, as I've been saying, for them to truly be in control, need to close a weekly candle above this area, push above, break out, retest it as support, then you'll know that it's for real. Now, lastly, the Dow Jones. Dow Jones also pulling back slightly on the day, 0.06%. Not that meaningful for the Dow Jones, right? Really using our previous area of resistance as current support. And your 12 EMA, this, this moving average right here, the yellow line, also acting as a zone of confluence. So tomorrow's report will be crucial for us because the Dow Jones is very close now. If we were to lose this area, it could be construed that we are going to set the lower high, maybe use this area as resistance then, and set the daily downtrend. That would be weekly consolidation for the Dow Jones. At that point, anything above 37,200-ish, uh, just going to be looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation into 2024. So tomorrow's report, crucial, crucial area for a lot of indexes. So going to be very curious to see how that unfolds. As we've said, if we do head into larger weekly consolidation, guys, it is just healthy consolidation for the month of March, April, May, June. After that, the bullish seasonality just continues, and I expect it to still be a good year for the markets. Nonetheless, as of now, the bulls still in full, full, full control until the bears prove us otherwise. Now let's move down to our big tech stocks. So big tech, Apple, 0.66% to the downside. Unfortunately, another red day for Apple, really battling with this 180 area, right? So what we need to see right now for the bulls is need to see them recapture 185.02. Capture 185.02, you reset the daily uptrend, and also you don't lose your weekly lows. We are teetering on the edge of a weekly downtrend. That would be a break and close below 180. If we get the weekly downtrend, however, it's not a big of a deal, guys, because the monthly bulls are still in control. It just becomes a little bit of a monthly tightening range, similar to something like Apple has done back in the past when it makes a big move up and then just kind of accumulates into its new found valuation. So I'm not too nervous on Apple. You guys know the drill. Anything below 180 all the way to about 170 is my buy target for Apple. So as long as we remain in this area, uh, it is looking good for me to be able to swing trade this. Now, keep in mind, the daily bears are still in control right now and a break of 180 would be significant. At that point, guys, we're probably heading to 175 and the next target would be your lows right down here, 168, 170. But as of now, they're still playing defense, still looking fairly good in terms of their ability to maybe overtake this. But again, the bears are in full control. If we just roll over, just keep an eye out for the lower levels, guys. Very healthy consolidation on Apple. No red flags other than your short-term bears being in control right now. Moving on to AMD. AMD also looking fairly good. So trying to set up the daily bull flag as well, right? So you had a loss of your lows right here. We have now engulfed the previous highs. So it's looking good. What the bulls want to do is maintain this bullish flag formation and break above higher. We need a break, guys, of 184.25. If you get that daily trend change to the bulls, you also secure 
a new weekly leg higher. We've been consolidating on the weekly now on AMD for about the past four or five weeks. So it's notable to us, right? In terms of uh, the bullish momentum that this stock has, it's a monthly uptrend. It is a weekly uptrend, beautiful weekly uptrend as well. Weekly bull flag rejecting nicely from your previous all-time highs, using those as support 164 down to about 158. So AMD looking poised for the breakout. But once again, if the markets fall apart after tomorrow's earning, after tomorrow's inflation report, I would not be surprised for AMD to start retesting this support zone as it just will stay stuck in this range right now. So it's go time for them. If we get a good report tomorrow and the markets are green, I'm pretty sure AMD has a very good shot at breaking this. But if the macro falls apart, we head into March seasonality, which is usually negative to the markets. I would expect AMD to start revisiting this lower area right here. Now moving on to Amazon, guys. So Amazon not looking too bad, down 0.22% on the day, but still looking fairly decent. So Amazon still has a daily uptrend. We're just looking for a daily higher low, anything above 166, daily higher low for further trend continuation. And if we do get that trend continuation, guys, we're going as high as your previous uh, resistance zone right here, which is about 177. And then you really have to deal with the all-time highs of 187. Which one is more important? I would argue the 177. It was resistance for so many times for the stock. Yes, the stock did spike above it a few times, but the 177 is more representative as a general uh, resistance area. So if we break that, guys, I think onto the all-time highs would be a no-brainer. So we're very, very close to that right now. But just keep in mind, if the report is bad and the bears take back too much of this move, could open the door for a lower high high, lower, low. At that point, guys, we would just be looking for further Amazon weekly consolidation here. Amazon looking very, very, very healthy right now. Even if we do consolidate a little bit all the way down to the mid 160, 162, even 160, that would just be a buying opportunity for your long-term bulls sitting here at the 12 EMA and also your monthly long-term bulls being in full control. So Amazon looking very good. I will be buying more if we head down into the lower 160 area. Moving on to Google. Google 137 43 guys down another 2% and now crashing through our big area of support. We were saying that this area 141 to 138 was a crucial zone to protect for Google because it was the weekly lows. And now, unfortunately, guys, we're delving in to potentially weekly downtrend territory right now. Weekly downtrend territory is all but confirmed. It would be confirmed if we close below this candle right here, 138 by Friday. But as of now, looking like a weekly downtrend, that may sound like a bad thing, but it's actually not that bad here, guys. If you take a look at the monthly, right? Monthly bulls are in full control, just looking for a monthly higher low. Anything pretty much above 120 is a monthly higher low for further trend continuation. So Google has just been plagued by a series of bad news headlines for their AI division over the past two, three weeks at this point, really bringing down the company hard. So daily downtrend is confirmed. If you want to see the bulls retake control, what do we need to do? We need to get a sizable bounce as high as possible in relation to 146. If the bounce bottoms out, if we bottom out here and start a bounce, that means that we need to see a bounce guys roughly all the way up to about 143 if the bulls can get up to 143 off of this daily bounce right here then potentially set the daily higher low we could get a recapture of the daily uptrend and start reversing this weekly downswing as well so going to be keeping a close eye on google one thing's for sure if we do revisit your lower support areas namely this zone right here we're talking pretty much the 134 down to pretty much 130 area that is super juicy as well so yes i am buying google right now making plays on it right now my next area is right down here 134 130 and if for ever which reason we go down 127 to 122, that is big, big, big time, big time leap call option territory. So Google not looking bad, but still has its work cut out for them. Decent buying opportunity in these levels, really starting to get a good discount from 52 week highs, guys, 11 and a half percent. Moving on to Meta. Meta, not looking too bad, 0.62% to the downside, still just sideways consolidation. So no real uh, trend in motion by Meta right now. We're still dealing with overhead resistance, which is about your $500 psychological level uh, on Meta. So as of now, the daily bulls are in control, but if tomorrow's report is bad and Meta just gives up the levels, keep an eye on this level right here, 462.41. You lose 462.41, well, you lose the daily uptrend, could set up the doors for the daily downtrend here and potentially open the doors rather for your weekly consolidation to be underway. Meta has a ton of room to give back. I would like to see them eventually touch back on this 12 EMA, talking about 428, 425 level. If it does come down there, I'll be making some plays on Meta between 420 and 410, because the valuation is still relatively cheap here, guys. Still very cheap for the company, right? 
looking very good, all things considered, just sideways consolidation at the top. Now moving on to Microsoft. So Microsoft as well, struggling a little bit on the day here today, almost flat. What is Microsoft looking to do? Well, they set the daily downtrend as of last week. First daily downtrend, as a matter of fact, on Microsoft since your sell-off back in September here. So it was a daily downtrend. Then Nvidia earnings came in and we engulfed the move. We're now looking for the daily higher low in relation to 397.50, daily higher low, for daily trend change the daily trend change which happened with a break of your most recent high 416 so we'll see if microsoft can do that or if we just roll over tomorrow with the report well it would just be into a new daily downtrend and at that point microsoft weekly consolidation just continues microsoft on the weekly is super healthy anything above 366 looking for a weekly higher low for further trend continuation no red flags for the business as well microsoft becomes a buy for me about 385 is when i personally start playing microsoft so microsoft looking good bulls still with an amount of space here we'll see how tomorrow's report plays out because it could drag a lot of this market down regardless of their individual technical setups Moving on to Netflix now. Netflix not looking bad as well, 0.86% to the downside. Still struggling to really break out above this $600 range, but is in a nice little daily uptrend right now. So any consolidation, just looking for a lower high, a higher low, anything above 568, higher low for further trend continuation. We're still battling guys with the 575. So we're trying to use this 575 area of resistance as newfound support. Next areas of resistance for Netflix, 620, and then it's your all-time highs at about $700. So looking good on Netflix, still a lot of space. The red flags come in if we lose this low and we give back this 575 area that we've mounted above so nicely in the past couple of weeks. If that happens, we get a little bit of an extended sell-off into March here. Just keep in mind, I'm looking to get Netflix myself. 530 down to about 500 is my sweet spot. Now moving on to Nvidia. Nvidia also not looking that bad down 1.32%. Yes, it is down, but still Nvidia bulls with tons of space here, guys. Look at this beautiful daily uptrend, right? Such a gorgeous daily uptrend, tons of space right now. Anything above 661, just going to be for a daily higher low for further trend continuation. Keep an eye on this area of confluence, previous resistance, and now your 12 EMA has caught up to the price as well. If you get a little bit of a sell down right down here to about 745, 740 ish, the bulls should have a little bit of a stand to put in. It just goes to argue though, however, after will they set the lower high into lower low? If we get some March seasonality and semiconductors correct, if that happens, Nvidia, tons of room to pull back, guys. Anything on the weekly above 475 weekly higher low for further trend continuation. So no red flags on Nvidia just yet. The red flags come in, in my opinion, if we lose 750 significantly, the bears take back too much. It opens the door for lower high, lower low, and then you're on for some weekly consolidation. And now lastly, uh, Tesla here, our three last ones. Tesla, not looking too bad, 1.16% to the upside on the day. Tesla, I'll remind you, still just looking to protect this current daily uptrend that we're in. So now, upon consolidation today a little bit from yesterday's highs, just looking for a daily higher low, anything above 190 daily higher low for further trend continuation. I need to see this daily uptrend continue at least, at least guys, on the weekly to about 220 or about 230. Why? Because that would be our required Fibonacci retracement to give the bulls the best chance at this weekly bounce of resetting the weekly trend further on in the year. So we'd like to see this daily bounce continue on a little bit more. Obviously, if we lose the daily uptrend here with a bad report tomorrow or something like that and start closing below this 190 level, well, the bulls take over the daily downtrend and now the weekly bounce will be over and just on to further weekly consolidation. At that point, guys, 180 down to 170, still a huge area of confluence. It is current support on the horizontal factor and also will be the bottom of your downtrending channel channel line which is this line right here so looking to forward to see what tesla does one thing's for sure if it dips down again i will be playing it down there now palantir palantir performing nicely on the day 0.4 percent to the downside but could be worse here guys a lot of things were down you know one two percent on the day so for palantir to only be down um 0.45 percent after such a significant rise is really amazing in my opinion now Palantir lost the daily uptrend. It was a daily downtrend confirmed. Just looking for the size of the bounce at this point to give the bulls the best shot at resetting the daily uptrend. And the size of the bounce is significant. I will give that to them. After today's highs, we took back almost 80% of this most recent downswing. So the bulls do have enough space now to set a daily higher low for further trend change. Any consolidation, we need to protect 2227 guys with our lives. 
for the daily higher low and daily trend change. If for ever which reason we lose this and continue a daily downtrend, that's fine. We have a very big area of support coming up. We're talking about $21 uh, to about $20 is the range that I'm looking at. It is the previous 52-week highs and also the bottom of the 2021 range. So keep an eye out on that for Palantir. Everything looking somewhat decent for the stock, however. And now lastly, PayPal, guys. So PayPal, Nice performance on the day by PayPal, finally mounting and closing above our $60 range. So now the bulls have confirmed a new daily uptrend with the high of today ever so slightly. So nice to see your short-term bulls back in control. I would like to see them start pushing now back above 62. We need to get above this weekly downtrending channel line. The channel line is currently sitting at about $62. That is when the momentum really starts for this, starts for this stock in my opinion. That being said, it's nice that we're now above our big area of congestion, 60 down to 57, these two yellow lines, huge area of prior congestion. So nice to see us finally back above that and protecting our weekly lows extremely well as well. We still have not closed a weekly candle below the $57 range, which is the cannot lose area in my opinion. So we'd like to see the bulls, now that the daily trend is recaptured, start mounting a rally beyond this trend line, start the breakout retest of this trend line and then really explode towards the $70 range. So we'll see what happens with PayPal. So far, so good, not looking too bad. So that was pretty much everything for today's video, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, consider dropping a like, would really appreciate it. Consider subscribing to the channel if you're new as well. We do these recaps Monday to Friday every day and then top five options plays for the week on Sunday. That's the Sunday night video. And as usual, guys, if you have any questions at all, always leave them down below in the comments. I'll see you guys tomorrow after the close. Peace.